Good afternoon. Uh, this is um, week three of roadblocks to Republic. And an incident like this is certainly a roadblock. Uh, the <coughs> business plot, as it's been called by some, or the, um, or the uh, American putsch, which some people back then called it, um, there, isn't, there hasn't been much uh, material written on this, uh, especially since the investigation was literally suppressed after a while here. Now, the New York Times began going great guns on this and then backed off. Time Magazine began going great guns on this and then backed off. And even the investigation slacked off into 1935. Th late 34 to 35. There have been a couple of, there have been a number of books written on it though, uh, and one here is a book written in 1973 by a Jules Archer. It's called The Plot to Seize the White House. She says it's been seized. <laughs> well, <laughs> Left you an opening there, you took it, very good. <laughs> we don't like people who are not ambitious. <laughs> uh, another one written in 1962 was by a man by the name of George Wolfskill, and it's called The Revolt of the Conservatives. And then there's another book written in 1947 called by George Seldes, called 1,000 Americans. And so there isn't a plethora of books written on this. There really isn't. And a couple of re a journalists, and you're gonna hear their names, will come out in this. One is a, name by the name of, a man by the name of John Spivak, and another one is Paul Comley French. And French will actually testify before the McCormick-Dickstein Committee. And the McCormick-Dickstein Committee was the first House of an American Activities Committee. It was chaired by John McCormick, congressman from the state of Massachusetts, who later becomes, chief, uh, later becomes Speaker of the House. And the co-chair was a Samuel Dickstein uh, from the New state of New York, who later becomes so, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, Chief Justice of the New York State Supreme Court. And so they will begin the investigations on this, uh, brought to light by a Marine Corps General, Major General Smedley Darlington Butler. Yeah, what a name, Smedley Darlington Butler. Yeah, be beautiful. <laughs> and uh, he, he's an interesting character from the perspective, he was from Pennsylvania. And he went into the Marine Corps as a private, and after a 33-year, four-month career, came out as a major general. That's quite a, that's quite a run. Uh, that's not the only thing about Butler. Butler is one of 19 Americans, or only seven Marines, to be accorded the Medal of Honor twice. And he will live to collect both of them. He, he was given his first Medal of Honor at Veracruz in 1914. You know, we got ourselves involved in the Mexican Civil War. His uh, second Medal of Honor, it was, it was like this fellow was a two, year, a two years in a row got the Oscar. Uh, his second Medal of Honor came as a result of, as being a major in the Marine Corps, leading a section of sailors and Marines against the Keiko resistance on Haiti in 1915. And those sailors and Marines came from Battleship Connecticut, by the way. Interesting, fascinating character. He will, when he retires from the Marine Corps, he will eventually, and he was very popular with the men, which is why the plotters want him. They wanted him involved in this plot, and I'll get to that. But Smedley Darlington Butler will later write a book. And that book is called <laughs> War is a Racket. That's what he calls it. And it became an anti-war classic. 
written by a two-time Medal of Honor recipient. Interesting, anti-war classic. And in this book called War is a Racket, he will say, I made it easier for Brown Brothers Banking to operate in Central and South America. And he says, I, he says, I raped a half a dozen countries down here. He said, I also made it, he says, I also brought light to the Dominican Republic for the sugar interests. He said, I, I made it easier for the National City Bank boys to operate in Haiti. And he also said, I, I allowed Standard Oil to operate unmolested in China. And then he even, even offers here that I could have taught Al Capone a thing or two. And he said, Capone, he operated his rackets in three districts. I operated on three continents. And I'm sure with a certain group of people in this country, that, bo that book didn't go over too well. He will warn about the rise of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany in 1933. He will die in 1940, and the, Uni and the United States Navy will name a destroyer after him called the USS Butler. And so he will be enlisted by the plotters uh, into this, into this so-called coup, or attempted coup. Now, it probably, uh, probably uh, behooves us to set a stage here as to how we get to this point in the first place. I mean, keep in mind, America's rising on the world stage. Uh, we are no longer a colonial backwater. We are, you know, we've moved from, and you're going to hear this again uh, when I get to that revolt of the planters when I do that series. You know, the, the Jeffersonian the idea of America as agrarian country lost out to the Hamiltonian idea. And now we are well on our way to that agenda. You know, we are a developed economy, factories, finance, so on and so forth. We're the world's leading economy at this point. And, you know, you've seen various machinations here in the, in the like in the mid-1890s when, uh, when Rockefeller thought that he, he, people like he, Carnegie, and, uh, and uh, the Morgans would never be able to make the money they would like to make in a free market economy. That it would behoove them, keep in mind, you couldn't vote for your senators then, going back to the mid-1890s. You know, senators were appointed by state legislators per your constitution. That'll be changed in 1913 when you can vote for your senators, but not yet. So it, so it would behoove them to pressure the state legislators to appoint the senators they want in Congress to pass those rules, laws, regulations that will enable them to arrange the economy for their benefit. He's already talking about a corporate state. We haven't even gotten into the Spanish Civil War yet. Well, that's not going to fly. Uh, you know, you're going to see the, of course, you will see, you will see, uh, people in 1913, Congress is going to pass that amendment to the Constitution to allow you to vote for your senators. But then again in 1913, what's passed by Congress? The Federal Reserve Act. Now you have the Fed. And so in World War I, uh, we get into this industrialized, corporatized, commercialized war. And the idea of organizing the American economy for war is required here because now you're in an industrialized war. And so the War Industries Board, Bernard Baruch, together, well, one of his assistants was General Hugh Johnson. And so we're going to organize the economy. And so, you know, if you have a company that makes widgets, you make so many widgets per your orders, per your customers, well, now everything's arranged. We need so many widgets from you. You got to have them such and such a date. They're going to be picked up by the transportation system, which is now overseen by Washington. That will be taken to the docks. The shipping companies will send it to Europe for the war, again overseen by Washington. What happened to free market? You can't have that in a war like this. Everything has to be organized. Kind of runs counter to how the, the founding of America, you know, something George Washington warned about. A large standing army. And so in 1929, though, uh, Gerard Swope, now we're in a depression. We are in a depression. Well, maybe what worked to organize the economy in World War I 
can now be used in peacetime to get us out of the Depression. Only here, Gerard Swope of GE, you know, the large corporations, large banks run their industries. And they will run these industries setting, you know, how many hours white collar workers will work, how many hours blue collar workers will work. And we'll have a social safety net for them. Get a load of that one. 1929, 1930. And Herbert Hoover doesn't want this. He says it smells like warmed over fascism. And he doesn't want to do this. And, you know, he's going to be virtually told here, well, guess where the money's going for the next election? You're not getting it. Of course, the Depression doesn't help Hoover anyway. You know, it's kind of hard being reelected in a Depression. And so by 1933, who wins the election? Mr. Roosevelt. Right. And he's saddled with a 25% unemployment rate. You know, this, this is one of the worst years of the Depression. A 25% unemployment rate, no social safety net, and many women really aren't working. You know, you don't have that two, that two wager in our economy you're later going to have. And so when the husband or the father is out of work, what happens to that family? That's a problem. And so there are some in this country who feel that perhaps we need a more direct approach to get us out of the Depression. And some of those people are going to be on Wall Street. And so it's interesting what arises here. One, and it's interesting, the, the Morgan interest, the DuPonts, the Pitcairns, Remington Arms, Guarantee Trust, from Wall Street, Grayson M.P. Murphy oversees this bank, which is, which is a Morgan affiliate. Remington Arms, heavily represents, re represented by the DuPonts. And so it's interesting where this develops. And there's a man that comes out of this named Gerald McGuire, who at one point lived here in Darien. And Gerald McGuire... Uh, is is was a <laughs> was a representative of at one point the Connecticut American Legion. And this isn't the last you're going to hear of the American Legion here either. Another one that comes out of this William Doyle from Massachusetts again the American Legion, and they want they would like Smedley Darlington Butler to be allowed in this plot. They want him to be ta they want him to take part in this plot. Number one, they know he's very popular with the troops. And as McGuire said, this guy could get a million men together overnight. Well, he's a two-time Medal of Honor earner. He's a dashing character. And, and so why don't, why don't we enlist him? And in July 1933, uh, Butler gets a, a phone call. And to be enlisted, the, well, they don't tell him he's going to be involved in a plot. What they want him to do is, the first thing they want him to do is run as the chairman for the American Legion and be a, rep a representative from Honolulu. The next thing they want is him to speak at the convention in Chicago, American Legion convention, in support of a sound dollar. Let's keep the dollar on the gold standard. And Butler says, what the hell do I know about gold? the heck do I know about gold? They will have a meeting in a hotel room in New Jersey. And Butler tries to enlist, uh, 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 McGuire tries to enlist Butler's support. And even to the point where he has a wallet with 18 $1,000 bills. Here we go. And in the course of these discussions, first, you know, Butler's under the impression uh, as this comes out here, you know, going to the going to the American Legion convention, and also at this point uh, speaking up on a sound dollar principle, it comes out where there, you know, uh, that Roosevelt, uh, McGuire gives it gives away that he's not a fan of Roosevelt, and maybe we need new government, and that opinion will change, and you'll see this change come. But at the same time, he wants. Butler in on this so-called plot. 
and he puts 18 $1,000 bills on the bed. And Butler says, tells him, you know, uh, you forget, he was a cop once. He was a, chief, he was a chief of police in Pennsylvania after the Marine Corps. You know, and Butler tells him, what, are you kidding me here? The, the, those serial numbers, I picked those up, I'm done. Oh, he's not stupid. And McGuire says, look, I'm going to Europe. And he says, when I come back, we'll talk again. So McGuire goes to Europe. Interesting here going to Europe. <laughs> Interesting here going to Europe. He states, you know, he's away for a few months. He goes to, not, he goes to fascist Italy. And what he wants to do is put together a, we'll call it, for, for want of a better description, an enforcement squad. He goes to fascist Italy, and he takes a look at the brown shirt, at the black shirts. And he comes to the conclusion, it's the black shirts that help keep Mussolini in power. We don't want that. He goes to Nazi Germany, and he takes a look at the brown shirts, you know, the stormtroopers. These are the guys that back up Adolf Hitler, you know, the beer hall brawlers. We don't want that. He finally winds up in France, and he sees a group here of ex-veterans, ex well, veterans, World War I veterans, guys who are highly nationalistic, who can be virtually on call if they need to so-called protect the government or in case there's an attempt to take control of the government. They are decidedly to the right. They are called the Croix de Feu. And that's what McGuire says we need here. And so he comes home. He will have another meeting with Butler. Interesting here, on the November 21, 1934, the New York Times prints, you know, this, this comes out later on to the public. And the New York Times is one of the leading newspapers that really puts uh, really be begins to cover this November 21 1934 the New York Times printed the first portion of the Butler story as told to the House of Un-American Activities Committee giving it front page treatment with an intriguing lead paragraph a plot of Wall Street interest to overthrow President Roosevelt and establish a fascist dictatorship backed by a private army of 500,000 ex-soldiers and others, was charged by Major General Smedley Darlington Butler, retired Marine Corps officer. The New York Times report added that Butler had told friends that General Hugh S. Johnson, former NRA administrator, was scheduled for the role of dictator J.P. Morgan and Company, as well as Murphy and Company, were behind the plot. Wow. That's big news on November, in November 1934. That's fascinating stuff. But there's another man involved here, Robert S. Clark, again affiliated with the Morgan interest, who Butler had known when he was in service in China. Only Clark has done reasonably well for himself. He says he's worth $30 million here. Willing to pour half of that into this effort. Interesting where this money's coming from here. Absolutely fascinating. But when McGuire meets with Butler again, he now tells Butler, uh, we're not interested in getting rid of Roosevelt. And Butler says, well, you were. When you, last time we talked, no, we don't want to get rid of Roosevelt but we think he's being overworked. That's a nice excuse. So the idea, get this, the idea is to kick Mr. You know, going back to fascist Italy, and this is where McGuire and some of these guys get this idea from, we'll kick Mr. Roosevelt upstairs, and we will have a secretary of, affair, a secretary of affairs to actually run the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, day-to-day um, uh, -day happenings in the country. Well, what happened to the vice president? What happened to that? And McGuire says the president can appoint this. He doesn't need to go through Congress. As an advisor, advisor, the guy's going to be a dictator. And originally, this is what they thought Butler could do. 
Butler turned around and turned them all into Congress, you know. He turned them all into Congress. And according to his testimony, interesting here is according to this testimony, <laughs> Butler, you know, Butler is, Butler is told by McGuire, we can get 500,000 veterans to press our claims. And Butler says, in other words, you're going to bully the president. No, 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 the president is with us. And Butler's reply is, if the president is with you, why would he need 500? He says, most of the voters put Roosevelt in. Why would he need 500,000 men for an enforcement squad for you know, McGuire's really not doing a good job selling this. He really isn't. And he and then virtually tells Butler, during, and this is the transcripts, that we can use these 500,000 men to impress our claims. For, in other words, a Wall Street fascist dictatorship. And Butler tells him, you can get your 500,000. He says, he was interested in... He says he was interested. He says, but if anything here smells like fascism, I'll get 500,000 more vets and we'll lick the hell out of you. And we will have a real war right here at home. And McGuire doesn't like the tone of that. And so this is what Butler tells the McCormick-Dickstein Committee. I mean, this is riveting testimony here going on here in these hearings into 1934. Makes the Kavanaugh story here small potatoes by comparison. By comparison. I mean, it's, this, this is absolutely fascinating here. Paul Comley French is one who Butler talks to. Paul Comley French was a journalist with the Philadelphia Record. And also with the New York, New York, uh, New York Sa Saturday Post, I believe it was called. And French is called before. French is called before the McCormick Dickstein Committee. And interesting what Paul Comley French states here with regards to um, McGuire. McGuire tells him that yes, they would like to have a dictatorship. And this is what he says. McGuire explains this. He says, this is against the communists. The bugaboo here are the communists. He says, the communists are against everything America was built on. And we need a fascist government to protect America. A fascist government? What happened to the republic? What happened to a functioning system of representative government? We need a fascist agenda here to straighten this out. And so it's interesting what's coming out here with the people involved. It's fascinating to see here. Another man comes out here. His name is Jackson Martindale. Jackson Martindale is interesting from, from uh, 14 Wall Street. He's actually an attorney affiliated with the Morgan interests. And a Captain Samuel Glazer comes to mind here. Captain Samuel Glazer runs one of those civilian conservation corps camps in Maryland. And he's told by the Adjutant General of the Army that he's going to get a visitor, this Jackson Martindale. And Martindale takes a look at how, you know, guys out of work are organized to build, like, the parks and so on and so forth. I mean, some of the parks, these beautiful parks you go to, were actually rebuilt or built by the CCC during the Great Depression. You can even see this on some of the signs on some of the parks. And Martindale states that perhaps we can do the same thing for factory workers in industry. But also, it eventually comes out in further discussions here that maybe we can organize guys like this uh, for military training out of the army. And even Glazer here, as a captain, understands what that means. Paramilitaries here? So he, too, is beginning to see in this plot, in this plot, 
that something really is not kosher. There's not so something not kosher going on here. Martindale, by the way, will never be prosecuted. Um, that he'll, he'll, his name will be <laughs> kind of forgotten here. At the same time, another name, another general who was actually seen here as a possibility, if not Butler, uh, suppose it was Douglas MacArthur. Now, MacArthur, his politics were to the right. MacArthur uh, is, that, is that general who cracked down on the bonus soldiers in Washington in 1932. And his adjutant was Dwight Eisenhower. And interesting here, nothing really much happens here as far as I could tell with MacArthur. But as this is winding down, this investigation is winding down in 1935, it often, you know, I, I, can't, you can't, I can't prove this, I don't have a paper chase for this, but I'm wondering if that's why MacArthur was assigned to the Philippines as the commander of American forces. It does make you wonder here. It really does. And if you recall, MacArthur uh, was one of those names thrown up for the Republican nomination against Truman. But then again, who wins that nomination? Eisenhower. Now, as you remember, in 1953, uh, you know, Ike, Ike, Ike gets that nomination, and, he's, and MacArthur is sitting at home, I guess reading the newspaper in the living room or something, and it's MacArthur's wife who tells him, oh, a Douglas, guess who got the nomination for the Republicans? Do Ike got the nomination. And MacArthur's reply supposedly was, well, that's good. He was one of the best clerks I ever had. And so as, this, as, this, as these investigations proceed, all of a sudden the New York Times is not devoting as much attention to the proceedings. Time Magazine is not devoting as much attention to the proceedings. And Congress begins to back off. Now this is going into 1935. Interesting here though, what John McCormick said on February 15, 1935. In the last few weeks of the committee's official life, it received evidence showing that certain, even though nobody's gonna be prosecuted here in the end, no bigwigs are going to be prosecuted, showing that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country. There is no question that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if financial backers deemed it expedient. This committee received evidence from Smedley, Major General Smedley D. Butler Retired, twice decorated by Congress of the United States. Your committee was able to, get this, your committee was able to verify all the pertinent statements made by Butler. And yet no one's going to be prosecuted. Does that sound like the banking crisis? I mean, this is, this is actually bizarre. This is actually bizarre here. Uh, but it, if, if but if you read the transcripts, this the test. Some of the testimony here is absolutely riveting. This would make a great television show. But in the end, no one's going to be prosecuted. And supposedly, the, the the Roosevelt White House was also involved in slowing down the investigation. The idea here is apparently we are in a depression. The last thing we need is for this country to tear itself apart politically because we will never, ever recover from this. And interestingly enough, with that National Recovery Act, who is involved with it? General Hugh Johnson is named to oversee the National Recovery Act with people like... Um, Gen uh, with uh, Gerard Swope from GE who came out with that Swope plan. And so, some, you know, and so nobody, the Morgans, the Pitcairns, the DuPonts, Remy, they'll, never, they'll never be brought up on charges. Never. And the whole thing kind of gets lost 
to the extent where nobody's really covering it anymore. And it was dying when John Spivak is interesting here. John Spivak, the, the journalist, <laughs> I have it here. He's actually, he actually talks to, um, he actually talks to, um, oh yeah, Spivak. You know, Spivak was looking to investigate Nazi and communist influence here. That was one of the, that was one of the aims of the McCormick-Dickstein Committee to investigate Nazi and communist influence here. Consider this is the first House of Un-American Activities Committee. Spivak is the one who asked Dick Stein, gee, can I have access to some of the uh, confidential documents? Yeah, sure you can. He stumbles on this. Interesting what he says here. John Spivak, reporter who unearthed the suppression of the congressional transcripts, challenged committee co-chairman Samuel Dick Stein of New York with his evidence. Dick Stein admitted that the committee had, get this, deleted certain parts of the testimony because they considered it hearsay. Spivak, but your published reports are full of hearsay testimony. Dick Stein, yeah, they are. Uh, <laughs> Spivak, wasn't Grayson Murphy called? Chairman of Guaranteed Trust. Your committee knew that Murphy's men, get a load of this, are in the anti-Semitic espionage organization, Order of 76. <laughs> Dick Stein, we didn't have the time. We'd had to take care of Wall Street groups if we had the time. I would have had no hesitation in going after the Morgans. And then... Spivak's reply is, you had Belgrano, commander of the American Legion, listed to testify. Why wasn't he examined? And then uh, um, Dick Stein's reply is, I don't know. Maybe you can get Mr. McCormick to explain that. I had nothing to do with it. And so you see this pattern, this progression coming where they're laying off from the investigation. And then the whole thing's going to be for virtually forgotten. It's a pretty sordid episode in American history, which really, for the most part, gets no airing here. Interesting if you ask Ken Burns to do this. I can bet you what the answer is going to be. Yes. It was formed in 1919. Yeah, it was formed in 1919 as a veterans organization. And, um, you know, you're going to have the VFW as well. But the American Legion was formed as a veterans organization because now we had been involved in this, in this global war. And, I mean, note the name, American Legion, Legion of Soldiers. And it's been around for over, well, over, this is the 100th anniversary this year. Or next year will be the 100th anniversary of this organization. Um, I mean, I know I go to the Post 12 over here in Norwalk first of every month because they have a, a ceremony for a departed veteran. And I go there, it's the first Sunday of every month. I go there every month. And you don't have to, if you wanted to have your a loved one remembered, they'll do it. They, they, uh, they pull out all the stops here. There's a firing squad, there's taps. Uh, they'll fly your family flag for the month until the following month when your flag comes down and the next family, it's the next family's turn. It's, very, it's done very tastefully and it's done very well. Uh, but then again, you know, there were, elements out of the American Legion that got involved with this. Um, so, but that organization's been around for quite a few years. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, patriotism. The, 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 the run-of-the-mill soldier's not going to know what's going on here. You know, the, the, the country's under threat, and, the, and they'll use, and the plotters will use the shtick of patriotism. I mean, that's, that's, and so the regular run-of-the-mill soldier or Marine, how are they going to know? They don't know. However, keep in mind at this point, many of these run-of-the-mill soldiers and Marines, or even sailors for that matter, uh, they're, some of these guys are out of work. And so when you look at what happened in, in, the, in Weimar, Germany, with the Freikorps, uh, you know, the German army is crumbling, but these guys, you trained them to be soldiers, you, somebody better give them a job, or that's a problem. And so you see these right-wing groups springing up through Germany. There was over 70 of these groups, 70 of these Freikorps groups in Germany. Free Corps is actually the translation of it. And they were practically, for the most part, all 
all to the left, all to the right. And many of these guys who were in the Fry Corps in 1918, 1920, and 21 will later wind up in the SA. Some of them will wind up in Hitler's SS. That's where, they wind, that's where some of them wind up. Heinrich Himmler being one of them. And so interesting here, these different groups. The, the black shirts in fascist Italy. Uh, well, the, the brown shirts, the SA. Uh, but then the Croix de Fure in France. I mean, France had a problem with fascism, especially in the 30s. They had a problem with this in the 30s. So, interesting. Yes? Th that's the point. Right. That's the point. That's the point. And so, you know, I mean, but you're talking about powerful interests here. Very powerful interests. And if you remember, there were some who called out Roosevelt. You know, R Roosevelt had to live with that stigma for a while. He was a traitor to his class. Remember that one? And so, but what is Mr. Roosevelt going to say later on? He's not going to say, I saved the worker. I saved capitalism. And so, yeah, uh, the, the idea is to bring this country together, not divide it. Because if we, if we split... Who's to say that the communists won't make an attempt to, you know, and, th and, th and that's the shtick here. You know, and then again, Mr. Roosevelt understands we're in a depression, 25% unemployment rate in 1933. Are people going to give up on representative government? There are options here. Bolshevism, fascism, Nazism. Well, we don't want that. We want a together country. But that means you're going to have to give something to the, the privilege set. <laughs> and so, but then again, when you look uh, by 1939-40, what really gets the country out of the Depression? Right. And so are the industrialists going to make money with that? Yes. And so between 39 and 41, Mr. Roosevelt's going to put 8 to 10 million people back to work. And so this plot will just... It will, lose, it will lose its steam. The investigations will lose their steam. No one's going to cover it, and it's going to be forgotten. Yes, and then I'll move over. Yes. Well, maybe what I ought to do next week when I do uh, the Lewis Powell memo is bring in that handout. I, ga I gave that handout out when I did the Nazi Revolution. Maybe I ought to bring it back. with the. I'm, I'm already making the handout up for next week, but maybe I ought to bring copies of the one I did on fascism and Mussolini's description of a corporate fascist state, where he said, <laughs> you know, he said that the worker is second, the corporation here. You know, one of the ultimate, one of the ultimate endeavors of a corporate fascist state is the corporation. And so in Mussolini's fascist Italy, the idea here is for large corporations, large banks, to run their industries. What happened to small business here? And so the worker exists for the state. Now, and Mussolini's idea here is these ideas unleashed by the American and French revolutions. Again, these ideas of liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, nationalism, parliamentarianism, uh, helped lead to 1914. And so we don't want that happening again here. And so instead of leaving it up to the people to decide their issues, guess who's going to do that? This corporate fascist state. And so the, in, the uh, rights of the individual exist only because of the state. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, it is. You're right. And interestingly enough, when you look at ideas like this, and don't think there aren't some in this country who favored that or favor that. And so when you look at the Bath Party, remember them? The Bath Party. Uh, Michael Aflag is one of these Syrian theorists in the 1920s who's putting together this thing known as what's going to be known as Bathism, a secular agenda. And so he said, he's, him, him, and his, him and his fellow theorists are going to consult fascism, uh, later Nazism, and socialism, and even Marxism, to put together this thing known as uh, bathism. 
and it will and it will be based on liberty, unity, and socialism. Interesting how they come up with this. Socialism, but just for us Arabs. No one else need apply. Uh, unity. We are all Arabs. We're all in this one huge tribe or clan. We're all Arabs. There are no, sounds like Muhammad to a certain extent. There's no differences. We're all part of this one tribe. Islam, well, now we're all part of this one tribe known as Arabs. And then liberty. What's your conception of liberty here? Now, when you were kids, right? Weren't you told the right of the individual? Huh, not so here. Liberty with, with Bathists, since we're all involved, since we're all in this, in this, in this movement known as Ar pan-Arabism, and since socialism just for us, liberty is not liberty of the individual. It's freedom from w virtually Western colonialism. But that's not individual freedom. And they're taking up where what? Mussolini left off? And so, yes, you see, you know, when you have a huge country that perhaps democratic tendencies or per democratic principles aren't going to work, you need some sort of centralized control. And so fascism is one of these mechanisms. Yes. Oh, f Hitler was a fascist. However, <laughs> uh, you know, everyone, well, yes, everyone equates Nazism or, 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 or Hitlerism, I even heard that term used, Hitlerism. Uh, and people who follow this are Hitlerites. But the fact, in fact, in writing a couple of things, I even used the term Hitlerites to account for his people who followed him. But regardless, he adds another element here, which was, it's to a certain extent with Mussolini's fascism, ardent nationalism to the point with the master race. But then again, Hitler is carrying forward with people like Georg Hegel, Gottfried Fichte, people like this where, yes, you know, uh, Hegel, uh, the, the ultimate endeavor of man is the state. And the individual is where? That sounds like Mussolini again, but this is before Mussolini. And he also states that the greatest locomotive man engages in for change, war. That's Hegel. And so Hegel appeals to the extreme right, some of these fascists. He will also appeal to Marx, the violent overthrow of the established order. What is this stuff producers and workers can get together to reach this kumbaya? Oh, no, no, the worker's not going to, the worker's not going to approve his lot unless there's a violent overthrow of the established order. <laughs> and so, yes, and when I get into next week, now this is kind of a, 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 uh, a beginning to next week, which is the Lewis Paul memo. And so what you saw here you know, the investigation tail off to bring the country together in the face of this horrendous economic downturn known as a depression, which in the end, the war is really going to get you out of. And we're going to emerge from this war in fine shape compared to everyone else. We will be the class of the world. And so now when you get to 1971, with the Lewis Paul memo, and I'm going to have I'm going to bring a copy of that with me too, because I have that thing. It's a fascinating read, and so this that's kind of a takeoff from what you saw develop here, and so you actually see with this Lewis Paul memo. Keep in mind Mussolini, 1922, Stalin changes the Soviet Union. You know, after Lenin's dead in 1924, what's what's wrong with this this peasant proletarian revolution stuff. We're going to industrialize the Soviet Union. So Stalin embarks on this program of industrialization. He's engaging in state capitalism. Hitler, January 1933, and he'll cater to the banks and the businessmen, despite the fact he doesn't like them, and the army. Yeah, we are hiring him. Now, how's that going to work out? And so, is it really surprising here that in the face of a depression, you're going to get people involved in a plot like this in this country? To me, that's not surprising. 
That's because it's because it's 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 in it's it's really gaining popularity here in certain countries. Yes. No, I didn't find anything about Lindbergh in this. I didn't find anything at all. Well, he was impressed. Lindbergh was impressed with the Luftwaffe. And Roosevelt will send him to Germany. He was actually going to send um, General Jean Vidal. Supposedly, he was going to send General Jean Vidal, who was his, uh, who, who was his com Air Commerce Commissioner at one point, Air Commerce, uh, Secretary of Air Commerce at one point, and he changed his mind, didn't want to send him because that would make it look like, we're talking like 1935, 36, 37, I can't remember exact year. That would make it look like sending a government employee from his administration as if he's sanctioning the Nazi regime. And so he will send a civilian, Charles Lindbergh, instead. And just so you know, interestingly enough, General Jean Vidal was Gore Vidal's father. Interesting, huh? yeah, interesting. And so he'll send Lindbergh instead. And Lindbergh was impressed with the advances made by, uh, by, by, by Goering's Luftwaffe. And he came back and he told Roosevelt, they're, he says, they're, they're more advanced than the French Air Force or the RAF. And so Roosevelt is now going to get on board here uh, with regards to air power because many of these Army Air, Force off, Army air Corps officers at the time would go into Roosevelt's office earlier in Roosevelt administration, and Roosevelt had pictures of all these ships on the wall. Where are the airplanes? No. And Roosevelt's going to get on board after the Munich crisis because he thought, Roosevelt thought, that the reason Hitler will get what he wants at, with, the, with the Munich crisis, the Sudetenland crisis of, of, of the fall of 1938, is because the Luftwaffe was superior either to the RAF and the French Air Force. And so he's going to tell the Air Force, look, we're going to start mass producing a lot of aircraft. And General Hap Arnold would say, uh, ah, now the, Air, now the Army Air Force will grow. And he's looking to separating the Air Force from the Army anyway. So now you got that politics going on here. And so... Um, so yeah, it's interesting here, but that's, that, you know, Gene Vidal was supposed to take, General Gene Vidal was supposed to take that trip, but Roosevelt put the brakes on that and sent Lindbergh instead, despite the fact that um, supposedly he wasn't a big fan of Lindbergh, but he knew good advice when he heard it. So, I mean, Roosevelt's on a hot seat here. Consider the time here. Consider the time. Interesting. Yes. And Eric Prince. That's right, it's Bessie DeVos's brother, right? Yeah, I guess, you know, we, yeah, every, every country breeds them. Well, I'll get into that when I do the Lewis Paul memo because those things follow. You know, it follows in a progression here. Uh, the plan for the new American century, Patriot Act. I'll get into that when I, I do the Lewis Paul memo. Yes. Yeah, GE, General Motors. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, even to the point where McGuire explains to Butler, oh, well, we don't want to get rid of Roosevelt. Well, you said you were last time you were here. Well, no, no, we don't want to get rid of Roosevelt. We, you know, virtually want to kick him upstairs and appoint a, pardon me, a secretary of, of affairs that will run the day-to-day, -day, run America on a day-to-day. -day. He says it's almost like in Italy, King Victor Emmanuel still sits on the throne, but who really runs Italy? Mussolini and the fascist council. It's the same principle. That's what he was implying here. And that's when Butler tells him, if you have anything smelling like fascism, then it goes from there. So Butler, I guess you could say, was somewhat of an ardent patriot. Um, but the, all this gets lost in the shuffle here, and it won't be covered, and the, and the investigation will tail off, and then it's going to be forgotten, and the country will come together for the war. Interesting, interesting time here. Well, this isn't really discussed. You know, again, try getting Ken Burns to do this. That's if he's going to do it. What would the backlash be? Yes. Well, I, you know, 
Well, when, when, you, when you go back to uh, 1933, when Hitler is called to the chancellorship, and you got to give him credit for one thing, he learned after the Munich Putsch in November 1923, the way to take power was legally. And that's how he's going to get it. Um, the alternative was what? The communists? And so, but many of the businessmen in Ger Germany and some of the bankers, yeah, they were, they were Jewish. Many were not. And so you are seeing here, um, because they don't want to go communist, they want to control, they want to control the worker, that perhaps we have no alternative but to call in, call in that, as Hindenburg used to say periodically, that vulgar little corporal. And, you know, we can, we can control him. And so Hitler will cater to people who he didn't like anyway. But he's got the, he's got the chancellorship. And, and, um, and the only real, and, he, and they put together a coalition government, mostly not Nazi. Um, Wilhelm Frick was the Minister of Interior. He was from the Nazi party. That's big because now you've got a policeman in the government. <laughs> and don't you want to control the organs of security? Yeah, you do. And so the Nazis, you know, then the Reichstag fire, which the Nazis blame on the communists, and they'll execute that Dutch halfwit, van der Lubbe, and blame him for it. And so this enables them to pass like, things like the Enabling Act, which allows them to get virtually end what's known as the Weimar Republic, and Hitler will rule by decree. You know, executive orders? We don't have tweets yet. But you see the progression that's being followed here. Beg your pardon? Twitler? <laughs> Well, it makes you wonder, what could have Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler done with Twitter? Picture that one. And so you see, these, you see this progression, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, the, you know I mean, go, go, go back over a period of time, and at one point, you know, you've always, and Marx was right about this, there's always that difference of opinion between the haves and the have-nots. At one point, it was nobility, monarchs, the, the dukes, and, and, and people were tied to the land. Then later on, when that dies, capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, now people are working in factories. You still have people who are making more money than others. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But then again, when they keep the mass in line and don't cut them in on a... On a on what can be considered an equitable share, well then again, you're back to the have and have nots, and you're gonna get people coming along like a Marx or a Lenin or somebody like that saying, you're not getting enough, let's throw, let's throw out the ruling class. And then you get somebody like Mussolini, well all these ideas of liberalism don't work, it leads to a war, so let's have a structured, a structured society and economy. And I mean, is that what you're seeing now? And so I'll get into that next week. But, that, but then again, take a look at, uh, throw China in here. What happened in March? Uh, there are no more term limits for Xi Jinping. He's now president for what? Life, and, or unless, okay, I'm taking a break, get someone else. But then again, he was in charge of the military and the party. No term limits there. And so what are the, what are the, what are the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party thinking? Well, let's understand Xi Jinping must have a lot of power here to do this if he has unlimited control of the army and, and no term limit as chairman of the Communist Party, well then why don't we just, the presidency, well, and so now he has all this power. And so, but then again, is China really communist? No, it's really not, but sounds nice, I guess, if you're a communist, but it really doesn't really matter. He's, he is, he's the power until he's ready to call it quits or someone pushes them out, right. And so when you have your current occupant of the Oval Office say after that, after that episode in China, gee, we, we should try that here. Yeah. And so where are we going? I mean, I'll get into more of that after the, when I do the Lewis Paul memo because that's an, that blueprint, that memo, 
is a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating thing to read. It really is. It truly is. Because after that, after that comes out in August of 1971, that's when a lot of these conservative think tanks come out. And that's when political action committees really begin to blossom like mushrooms. Interesting what you see here. Yes. Could be. I mean, you, you bring up an excellent point here. Uh, in other words, uh, by, by comparison with what you're implying here, this thing never really gets off the ground. And that's, and that's, and that's a good thing. But you're right, it really wasn't a popular movement from the perspective of organizing workers, whatever the case may be. No, we're going to get a half a million soldiers. And then Butler says, well, I can get a half a million soldiers and we'll look the hell out of you. And so it's like, it's like checkmate here. It's checked. And, but as... We, yeah. But, but then again, uh, you know, when you have so much money backing you, uh, you can buy whatever you want. You can buy whatever you want. But it doesn't go that far. And part of this is because the part of this is the press backed off. Even the White House will call an end to this. And so they will come together and try to structure the economy to get us out of this depression. And so there will be, and, and Roosevelt's going to play the game too. I mean, let's understand this. Uh, he got money from, uh, from people like, uh, you know, Bernard Baruch, uh, the, the Rockefeller interests, uh, to be elected president. And so is he going to cater to their agenda to a certain extent here? Yeah, he is. He is. Because in the end, again, uh, and even though, even though he was getting pressure from the unions, some of who were influenced by socialists and communists. And so it's, it, you know, America is, is, is an interesting jumble here in the 1930s politically. And so it's almost like Roosevelt is trying to accommodate all of them here. That's hard to do. And, you know, what is it that, what did Abraham Lincoln say? You can, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And so Roosevelt, Roosevelt, yes, it's going to be the war that gets us out and even unifies us here. But we don't have, interestingly enough, we don't have a full-fledged revolution. And that probably goes back to the case that Again, this was not a mass movement. It was a restricted movement. You didn't have a broad base here. Of course, keep in mind, you know, again, since it wasn't broad based, maybe it's easier to put a stop to this. You know, unlike what happens in Russia in 1917. Fortunately for us, we had not lost a war then, and so that added disgruntlement of nationalism was lacking. Like in Russia or Germany in 1918, 1919. Now you don't have that here. Thank God. You don't have that here. And so America will come out of this by 1939, 1940, and by 1945, since we don't have a revolution here, we're the top power in the world. That's an interesting progression. We're the top power in the world. Of course, maybe we're under competition now, but not in 1945. Somebody else had a hand up. No, but, but then again, uh, maybe, just maybe, if they had maybe moved the needle to a le the left a little bit, you know, they're, they're, not, they're, they're, not in the they're not in the move to help you. Join us. We'll throw off the established government and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get you on board, and we'll, and we'll see to your interests. How are you going to do that if, if you're in a depression? You know, but then again, in some places like Germany, people are down on their luck. Um, of course, again, I think what helped us then is we had an established track record of representative government, so not everybody is giving up on it. And I think that's something we should remember now. We should remember that now because, you know, when you go into, 
uh, you, you, you take a look. Um, I was listening to David Rothenberg, who was a uh, Broadway publicist and a, and a producer. He volunteered time uh, this past summer to sign up young people, 18 to 25, to vote in the midterms. Did, did you see that? Well, anyway, he stated, on, he has a radio show every Saturday morning, but he stated, he said, for every 25-year-old I signed up, there was that 25-year-old say, why bother? It doesn't, do, it doesn't do any good. You know, and then look at the last presidential election, 46.7% stayed home. Only 53.3% voted. That was it. And so, yeah, in 1776, in one of the closest, in one of the closest, uh, yeah, 1876, 1877, it, 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 that led to the North pulling troops out of the South. That was the end of Reconstruction. And, um, <laughs> Rutherford B. Hayes, I think it was, he beat, he, um, oh, what the heck was the guy's name he beat? Democrat. He won by one electoral vote. 80%, some 80% of the people voted. And it's one of the closest elections we've ever had. Interesting. Fascinating. And so 53.3% voted in the last election. Well, but are they voting with their feet? Are they voting with their feet? And in fact, there was another one here um, uh, that in the hour it released uh, some figures on for in, the, in July. Uh, was it July? Yeah, it was July. Uh, of uh, si people signing up in this state. And some 12,000 and change between November 9, 1960, uh, 2016 until July 9, 2018, some 12,444 people, young people, voted, registered as Democrats. And in that same time frame, 5,274 registered in this state as Republicans, over 24,000 registered as unaffiliated. And I wrote a, I wrote a, um, a commentary on that and they published it at RSN News and I made my comment this is a great trend let's keep it going here <laughs> unaffiliated um, so it's interesting here the, the 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 patterns here but again you can't discount what David Rothenberg said now for every 25 year old I signed up well there was a 25 year old said why bother it's not worth it um, and that really you know I People shake their heads. Some people say, well, they, you know. But keep in mind, many of these youngsters are saddled with student loan debt. What have Democrats and Republicans done to cut, help them out? And that's how they're going to see this. Again, the pocketbook. Go back to this. Yeah, people down on their luck. And so even though our, even though our, our rep form of representative government will survive, I mean, go back to 1933, and I'm sure that was, a, that was a scary time here. You know, farmers being foreclosed on, people on the roads going God knows where. You had the Dust Bowl. Now you're growing less food, perhaps. That's a frightening time here. It truly is. That's a frightening time. Wow. So anything can happen. And so when you see things like uh, the McCormick-Dickstein Committee investigating the so-called plot, and then you take a look at th uh, things like what happened in 2008, no country is immune from shocks. No country is. Even us. Go back to what I mentioned last week, the, the Alien and Sedition Acts, and you're going to prosecute people writing, writing something that because you don't agree with it? That's supposed to be America? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Or because they say something like Upton Sinclair, who was arrested during the First World War for reading the Bill of Rights in public? Yeah. Wow. Yes. Um, when you get into um, Anthony Sutton, 
who wrote a trilogy here, uh, Wall Street and FDR, Wall Street and Nazi Germany, Wall Street and the Bolsheviks, and all three have the same names in them. People from Wall Street getting, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, Wall Street will support the Bolsheviks to a certain extent. And that's understandable. They want to loan money. You know, uh, this fledgling Bolshevik Russia needs money. And to Wall Street, the dollar is as big as a bedspread. And again, that's what, that's what they're in business for. They also want it paid back. And so, as, uh, and, th and I agree with this theory that you begin to really see here this idea of corporate socialism being formed here. But then again, if you're putting together a country just like they're doing in fascist Italy, the corporate state, this leads to corporate socialism. You know, uh, they're going to get a greater cut of the profits than you are. And so when it's structured along these lines, why are they going to want to lose this? And so they'll reach an accommodation here. Uh, you know, you can't tear the country apart because Roosevelt will later say, you know, in trying to get some of the rich on board with him to throw to the economy and let's have a social security let's let's build some sort of social safety net let's pay the worker more what do you guys want do you want half a loaf or no loaf and some will some will come around and so why would we want to keep investigating this plot uh, if, if 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 we can reach some understanding here um, which makes you wonder uh, today, are there any, or is there anybody good at negotiating like that? James Baker would be, people like this. And so America will survive, even to the extent that, interestingly enough, in 1940, the Roosevelt administration will come up with the DPC. Again, carrying forth corporations and big government. I mean, you can't have monopolies here without collusion of government uh, in a modern economy. And, and, and Roosevelt's going to come up with the, 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 his administration, the Defense Plant Corporation. Get a load of that name, Defense Plant Corporation. We're not even in the war yet. The DPC. What, are they, what, is this, what does this government company do? It takes, well, taxpayer money and builds factory space and will lease it to, the, to, private, uh, to private companies to build weapons. It's, it's, a great, it's a great example of government and business coming together to increase um, producing war goods. Or as, or as I like to call it to a certain extent, war socialism. Nice term. Nice term. Well, that's kind of a, a bounce off war communism. When Lenin, uh, fighting the Civil War, Okay, we have to take some of the grain, we have to take some of the livestock, and what little industry the, Soviet, or the Russia had, we need to produce weapons and produce those goods for this civil war to beat the whites. Well, here, we're not in that situation, but we are in a, we're going to be involved in a world war. Plus, before we get into that war, we're producing weapons for what? Export. Until the British gold runs out. <laughs> and then they can't pay for it, well, we'll, we'll you know, lend lease, right? Remember that one? You know, you're going to lend these weapons to the British, and then they're going to give them back. How many are they going to give back? But what happens here? Some of these big companies will make what? A lot of money. As Smedley Darlington Butler says, war is a racket. Although with World War II, I will agree, there was that element of patriotism with the common everyday Joe after Pearl Harbor. You know, you do understand here that if you lose, <laughs> what's the alternative? Nazism, virulent uh, militarism, so you gotta fight it. So, so it's interesting here. I mean, it's a tight, you know, modern war get, gets to be a tightrope here. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the industrial revolution, capitalism, technology, and it encompasses now an entire country. Well, now you've got the technology revolution. You don't need as many bodies anymore. But up to World War II, yeah, you needed a lot of bodies. Why? Because now there's more factories. You can build more weapons. And with technology, that weaponry is improving and killing more people. 
So now you need more bodies. It fe it's, this, it's just this process, one feeds on the other. And again, you can see this with the Great French War of 23 and a half years where six and a half million dead uh, you, you, in Europe. You, you go to the 1914-18 conflict, 15 million dead, and then 39 to 45 upwards of 60 million dead. I mean, this is what man does with his technology and, 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 his, and his ability to make weapons. You know, I remember one guy saying, you know, defining war. And, you know, the guy, the guy was a GI in World War II. He says, war is simple. It's trading, it's trading, uh, it's training bodies for men. I mean, it's training, it's trading, it's getting land for men. That's what it is. Interesting here. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, if, but, but then again, talking about encompassing an entire economy or an entire society for war, the more men you put in a uniform, who has to make up for the manpower? Right. And so I'm a big proponent of what you call World War I, but more so World War II helped advance the cause of the women. Now they're in the economy, more so than ever before. And what's, and what's, and what's fascinating about that, these women are making the weapons for their loved ones who are at the front. Talk about a united effort here. That's fascinating. It really is. Is it going to change your society? Yeah, it will. And so will this thing like the, the business plot be forgotten? Keep in mind, there is, no, there is no plot here in 1945. What do you need a plot for? Everyone's together. And we're not going to go into a depression after in 45. Because there's no one else in town, no one else in the globe who can make those, make those goods that are necessary to get us out of, get us, out of the, get us into the post-war world. There's nobody else that can do that except us. So, interesting here. Fascinating. Anyway, anybody else have any questions or, or comments? Yeah, the, the business plot, the, you really got to look to find information on this stuff. You really do. You can find some, but it's not going to be as prevalent as something like the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, or something like this. So you really got to look. I happen to, I happen to find the, the, um, the transcript for the McCormick Dickstein Committee. That's where I got a lot of this from. I got 113 pages of it. But even here, even here, uh, my version has some of what was deleted. Most of what was deleted, I don't have. I mean, I would love to have uh, what was, you know, asked by some by some of the people like the Duponts and the Morgans. I don't have that. And so it's so you know that's to me missing. So. Fascinating. Fascinating. You're welcome. Have yourselves a good evening. Are we supposed to get rain tonight or tomorrow? Tonight? Yeah, it looks like it. Have a good evening.